Good morning, Anthem. I'm usually up here just for a couple of minutes and uh, sharing a, a welcome with you, but today you have to listen to me for a lot longer. Um, I think the reason that the um, uh, Pastor Buddy and Pastor Chris have the elders come up once or twice a year to preach us so you can contrast how good they are compared to us, and it actually makes them look a lot better. I think that's the sole purpose of it. And by the way, you'll notice um, all, all the technology up here. Um, I'm actually going to pull out another one. Um, and it does really speak to the matter that you can teach old dogs new tricks. I can actually figure out how to use all this stuff in my old age. But I actually pulled out my Bible this morning. I was going to go, so I got a lot of scripture, so I'm just going to pull out my Bible. And I realized that at home, the only way I can read my Bible at such fine print is I have to take my glasses off. And you guys would be a total blur at that point. So um, I decided to pull it up on here. So that's why I've got so much uh, uh, hardware up here. I actually have it all written down just in case they all crash, because you know what? You don't want to be up here if it all crashes. So today, we're going to actually talk about a, a, a message that the Lord put on my heart probably a year ago, and the title is actually Carp Diem versus Carp Calum. And uh, Carp Diem versus Carp Calum is the, what the Lord laid on my heart, and then the filling in of it, I thought I totally had it all. I mean, I just, I thought that was easy to do. Um, let me tell you, this last week has been just a holy unrest. Um, in fact, probably rewrote most or half of this yesterday, um, after I read it to my wife, and uh, I, I never, in all the times that I used to uh, uh, sub in for Pastor Bob, uh, I never read my sermon to my, my wife, and for some reason on Friday night I read it to her and started to rewrite it after that point. Um, and I, 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 I often long for the days when, um, when I used to sub for Pastor Bob, we used to have three services, and so the first poor first people got the, the first run, and by the time you got to third service, you actually had it down pat, and it was actually a good sermon at that point. Unfortunately, we only have one sermon, so I'll, hopefully I'll be able to get it right for you. But you know, one of the things about the end of the year that I actually like is it, 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 it has been traditional for almost everybody to take a look back at what the year's been like. And then you take a look forward as to what's the next year going to look like for us, and, and for a lot of us, it looks... Uh, fearful. For a lot of us, it looks like a lot of fun, uh, new adventures, new ideas that are happening. But it is a time to reflect. And we have just gone through an Advent series, by the way, which was incredible with Pastor Buddy and Pastor Chris, where they talked about hope and joy and peace and love and culminated with the message that the only way that we could ever imagine that we could get any one of those things is through the son that was going to be born through our, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the only one that could actually ever be the Prince of Peace to us. So today I want to share with you the most expensive gift that we actually are going to receive free. And before I start, let's pray. Father, I don't even have a clue why each of these people have walked through the door, but you do. Um... And Lord, I don't really understand why you would choose me, but you do. And in the midst of that, Lord God, I pray that only your words would sink in. Only your words would be the ones that would not return void. And Lord God, that as um, we open ourselves up to just you to speak to us, that you would, Lord God, share what you want of us. As we talk through these issues, Lord God, I pray that... Um, uh, you would be glorified in it all, and Lord, that you'd give me a clarity, and that you'd give me just your words to speak, Lord God, that um, you would uh, amaze me at uh, the words that come out. So Lord God, we give this morning to you, and we just thank you for it, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you um, a, uh, a synopsis of Romans uh, chapters 5 through 10. And one of the things I actually love about Pastor Chris and Buddy is they actually are not afraid to go verse by verse, book by book. They don't skip around and, and use topical themes and, and speak on their pet things that they want to say. And yet when we come up here for just one, one message, 
the danger is, is that we will pick something that's a pet to us and that we will actually just give you words that actually uh, come from just what we want to say instead of what the Word of God has to say. So I would encourage you to read through Romans um, because Romans is un an incredible message from Paul to the Christians in Rome, probably written from Corinth, but he says some amazing things to them. He talks about um, what it means to be in Christ. He talks about uh, the fact that, um, so in, in Romans uh, chapter 1, by the way, I highlight everything that just steps, uh, sticks out to me. He talks about that he's not ashamed of the gospel, but that it's going to be presented to the Jew and the Greek first. Um, he talks about that there are invisible attributes, namely eternal powers, and he talks about that um, God's everywhere, and we're without excuse if we really deny that he really exists. Um, he also goes on and talks about the fact that we have impure hearts and that we often dishonor God in all that we say and do. Um, he says that God has a righteous judgment in, in chapter 2. And he says that he will condemn those that have not given their lives to Christ. Um, and he also talks about, by the way, that we have hardened hearts. That's what he said to the people in Rome. Now, talking to Christians, he said, But because of your hard and impertinent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's in chapter 2, verse 5. He goes on in 3 to talk that God's righteousness will be upheld. He says that nobody's righteous except for himself. No one. So no one can say that they have a righteousness in and of outside of who God is. And then he talks about Abraham being justified by faith. And we're going to talk a bit about that. So from from verses, or chapters 5 through 10, I'm going to pull Scripture out, but I truly want you to go and look back and go, was he really telling the truth? Was he really talking about what, what, what Paul really wanted to say? But let's just look a second for uh, carp diem. So most people, you guys know what carp diem means? Have you heard that saying? Yes? No. no. So carp diem means seize the day. And it's probably a generational thing. Um, probably back in my generation, that was a, f a, familiar, a familiar saying. But it comes from the uh, year 89 AD, basically. There was a Roman poet named Horace. And he said, um, he used it, there, or the, the rough definition of it is, do whatever you want now because who knows what the future looks like. We cannot guarantee the future, so do it now. Have fun when you do it now. Right? So modern-day version of that, a modern-day um, uh, corollary to that would be YOLO. Anybody heard of YOLO? You only live once. And what's the undertone of that? You only live once, so whatever you want, do it. Because really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. And by the way, there's really no, no harm in whatever you do, right? How many have heard of sex, drug, and rock and roll? then you're really going to date yourself there, right? Well, wasn't that, that's what the world said. Just do whatever you want. Seize the day. Go. Have fun. Every lust, everything that you ever think of, go ahead and do it. And you know, we often read that places like Corinth, where Paul would have been writing the letters, were just one ugly, do-whatever-you-want place. And it was in your face. It was, it was like Las Vegas on steroids. It was Sodom. But how different are we today? We just can do it in the privacy of our own home. Or we can do it where nobody sees us. So seize the day. It's interesting that seizing the day, by the way, can have a very good connotation to it. Seize the day. Do the things that, you, that you're called to do. By the way, seizing the day, getting a job, getting married, um, having friends, enjoying what God's creation is like. Don't just sit back and not do that. It's, it's incredible. Do those things. The problem that we face 
is that the world gets in the way and the world perverts that which God would have said, look at it, look at your creation, enjoy it. There is a, a novelist, David w Foster Wallace, um, he, in the end, close to the end of his life, lived in Australia, but he gave a, um, a uh, graduating speech at Kenyon, Kenyon College, which is a liberal arts private college in, I think, Ohio or someplace like that. It was in 2005. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about what he is about to say is that he penned these words just not long before he committed suicide. Let me, t let me, let me tell you, this, this, to me, what he does, he delineates the whole concept of false agreements. And I'm going to come back to that, con that statement, false agreements, that we're going to be discussing. Um, but I want you to listen to these profound words. He says, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. You'll never feel you have enough. If you worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when the time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve your loss. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fears. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is they're unconscious. They are a default settings in our lives. Yet somehow, many have come to believe that a person can be a Christian without being like Christ, a follower who doesn't follow. How does that make any sense? Many people in the church have decided to take on the name of Christ and nothing else. This would be like Jesus walking up to those first disciples and saying, Hey, would you guys mind identifying yourself with me in some way? Don't worry. I don't actually care if you do anything I do or change your lifestyle at all. I'm just looking for people who are willing to say they believe in me and call themselves Christians. Seriously? It's interesting speech to a liberal arts college, by the way. That's carpe diem in its worst form. And yet it is the thing that can draw us away from who our Savior wants us to be. So let's contrast that to carp calum. Probably shouldn't ask, but anybody know what carp calum means? Yeah, I didn't know, by the way, until I actually looked it up. Because it, even though it came to me, I just didn't uh, actually really understand it. Carp calum means to seize heaven. Seize the day or seize heaven. To me, this statement really embodies the idea of changing my focus from whatever I can get out of life to God. What do you want me to do with my life? that make sense? The twist between the two. By the way, and it all starts with the new covenant that cost Christ so much to be given free to us. It's interesting that, that Austin, uh, one, had the song that he had, and then uh, the scripture that he put up. Because we need to understand that the new covenant, or what, he, what even the new covenant is, we have to understand what the old covenant was. And the old covenant given to Abraham was a promise. And promise to a guy who is uh, like almost double my age that he would be the father of, of, of generations that there would be more people than stars in the sky. And that God would be with them. And if you think of the natural flow that came out of that, they got the Ten Commandments. Moses brought them down. But you know, at the time of Jesus... They had morphed those into, what, Dan, over 600 laws? Over 600 laws that they had to keep. And built a temple system that is phenomenal, but in its actions, I can't even imagine. 
You see, because in order to be atoned of your sins, you had to go to the temple, bring an unblemished sacrificial animal, and it could be, depending on your, um, your social status, it could be a ram, could be a lamb, could be a dove. But the transference of sin was then on to that unblemished sacrificial animal. And so the blood of one of those sacrificial animals was to cover your blood. So just think of it in, the, in, in that whole concept, in, because the disciples were brought up in that. The, that's all they knew. They're walking with Jesus, and, and they're, they're going, what? What are you going to do? So at the Last Supper, what does he say? This is my blood, which is said for you. New covenant. And the, I can imagine sitting around going, what? It's the blood of rams and lambs and doves. And he's saying his blood will be the beginning of a new covenant? You see, Jesus knew before the beginning of time that that new covenant would exist. And that new covenant would be between him and anyone that would accept it. That his blood would cover the sins not now, but forever. They wouldn't just cover when you sin when you walk out the door or what you did yesterday or this morning as you drove in here. Jesus' sins covered. Jesus covered every sin you can imagine with his blood as you give your life to him. You see, he was saying, it's not the ram's blood, it's my blood. And it's not the blood of a man. See, a blood of a man really would have been almost the same as the blood of a ram because it would have, could only cover just those sins. But it was God, eternal. His blood shed eternally covering every sin that can be imagined. So let's go to Romans 5, and we're going to just read 1 through 11. And it should be up. Yeah. You know, the font looks way better when you're putting it on a little screen on your computer like this, right? You have it? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Justified by faith in God brings us peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ and only through him. You cannot obtain peace through God except through his son Jesus Christ. The acceptance of that gift. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And I'm going to come back to that. Just so to, I, love, I love pictures. And pictures help me to understand often a lot of things. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to that. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Really? I mean, last time, you'll hear me tell a story later on. There ain't a lot of rejoicing that I seem to be able to find in suffering. And yet, that's teaching me. <clears throat> Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts. By the way, it's an important thing to understand that the transformation that occurs, occurs in our heart. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one scarcely dies for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God, which Paul talked about earlier. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life, by his resurrected life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, God's, 
love poured out to us while we were yet sinners. And whether you want to believe it or not, Adam brought sin into the world. Every generation from Adam on was cursed. We were born into sin. You may not like that, but we were born into sin. And through one man, that was all wiped away through Jesus Christ. If we commit our lives to Christ, we have a new heart in Christ. In fact, it says we have a new DNA. Our DNA is totally changed. We're a new creation. You cannot be a new creation and have some old stuff hanging around, right? That's not new creation. A new creation is something that's never been seen before, something that's never been around before. That's a new creation. We have new DNA. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Starts here. Remember? Poured out his Holy Spirit into our hearts, so our hearts are new. That's part of that new creation. That's part that is not changed. I listened to uh, 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 my mentor, my mentor, um, by the way, as an aside, men, if you do not have a mentor, I strongly encourage you to find someone who will walk through life with you and encourage you. But my mentor actually put me onto a pastor named Andrew Farley. And I, so I was listening to a podcast of his. And he, he was telling a story. And one of the stories was, um, you don't actually, if you see a non-believer, you don't say to them, by the way, if you quit smoking... If you quit chewing, if you quit hanging around girls that do, um, that's all you got to do. Stop cussing, by the way, and then you'll be okay. Do you, ever, do you ever tell somebody that's the way to salvation? Right? No? So then how come it is that we say it is Jesus plus? Jesus and you need to do these things. He said it's, if it's ridiculous to say to a non-believer that these are the things you do to actually be saved, why would we say them to a Christian? By the way, if you become a Christian, that's fabulous, but you now have to do these things. Instead of, what does your Savior want you to do? What have you heard from Him? What's He telling you? In Ezekiel, it says, I will give you, in Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Isn't that amazing? By the way, that scripture is taken out of context. I just want you to know. There's a whole story around that scripture. The point I want to get to you is, prior to Christ, we have hearts of stone according to him. And he puts a heart of flesh and a spirit indwells in us. Romans says in Romans 10 at 9 and 11. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Paul is repetitively, repetitively telling his people, put your trust in him and you will never, ever feel ashamed again. See, we are totally forgiven with no fear that we'll miss something that will keep us from the intimacy with our creator. Do you hear that? He desires relationship with us. And oftentimes we walk in fear that if I do this, oh, I messed up again. I'm sorry, Lord. I've fallen out of your favor. I can't be in intimacy if, you, if he only knew what I do. Well, he does. If he only knew. And we feel like we lose intimacy when we sin. In fact, God desires intimacy, and rest assured, that intimacy doesn't have to be worked for. You hear that? Intimacy with God does not have to be worked for. We are a new creation, and that is settled. That position is settled when you give your life to Christ. And because of that, each day we choose to live in the spirit and all its truth, or in the flesh and all its pain. 
You see, he truly desires that we would abide in him, which means to be in Christ, to be in fellowship with Christ. That's what he desires. In Romans 6, 22 to 23, it says, but we, ne- we now, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, which, by the way, means to be holy or set apart or sacred, consecrated, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Free gift. You don't give a gift to somebody and go, well, you better not. (laughs) By the way, you better treat this gift right or else I'm taking it back. Do you? I don't do that to my kids. I don't do that to anybody. You give the gift and go, it's free. I've given it to you. No, 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 it's too much. No, No, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. We've all been there. He gives us a free gift. And because of that, in Romans 8, 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons Realize that? Spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And if heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do you guys believe that this morning? Do you believe that you're a son or a daughter of the living God and no one can take that away from you? As I was listening to that podcast of Christ Plus, we have the absolute best example of Christ and Christ alone in the thief that was on the cross next to him. Jesus didn't say, by the way, if you, then you, no. What Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's the best example that I can imagine of what Jesus thinks that we need to do in order to be saved, in order to walk with him, is to accept what he gave to us. I tell you, I'm a, as I said, I'm a visual guy. And I think we have the, yeah. Can you guys see that? See, in a grace, on the one side, on your right-hand side is, is grace. And it's a progression. But the first thing that occurs that's actually positional that I've talked about is that when you give your lives to Christ, your relationship is secured with him forever. And because it's secured with him forever, your identity is now a son or a daughter of his. Those don't change. Unless God for some reason, or Jesus for some reason, loses the ability to save us. We're sons or daughters of his. And because of that, we start that transformation that occurs. Because we're a son or a daughter of his, we actually then say, God, what is there about me that you would like to change? What are my thought processes that you need to walk through with me? Are there things about me that you would like to see transformed? That has nothing to do with your position, by the way. Remember, or your favor with God. And then out of that, it's your behavior. Man, if I'm saved, if God loves me, if I'm one of his kids, Dad, what do you want? What would you like? Where would you like me to go? You see, it has the behavior. Our behaviors have nothing to do with our position in this. Unfortunately, some of us come out of backgrounds where behavior is the most important thing. And sometimes as parents, we often get stuck in that trap. 
and we, we, we actually don't say it, but we imply it, it'd be great if your grades were better. It'd be great if you cleaned up your room. Oh, I would love it if you didn't lie to me, right? We start to make behavior the most important thing. To me, that's legalism. And in legalism, and we see it, and that's sometimes why people just go, I hate the church. You ever, it's just a bunch of rules and regulations. You ever hear that statement? And part of it comes out of the fact that whether we, whether we do it or, or try to do it, if you start to put behavior as the number one thing, then all the rest of it doesn't matter. Because all you're looking for is their behavior. But that's not what God does. The grace of God works from the bottom, not from the top. We are His. We are sons and daughters of His. If I am all that my Heavenly Father says I am, it is with profound love that I'm going to ask Him, what would you have me do? Carp Calum. Get my head around it. Um, to try Because there's, there's one thing to know when I get a hug from my wife. I can feel that love, right? Get a hug from God. He loves me even more than my wife does, but there's just this. So sometimes in order for me to get my head around things, I have to I revert back to my wife of 41 years. Um, I love her so much. I go, what would you like me to do? What would you like? And I don't do those things just to prove that I love her. I don't do those things to make her love me more. I do them because I love her. It's just, that's the motivation of my heart is to actually love her. The problem, and this is, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm constantly a guy of, so what? You know, it's cool to hear all that, so what? And this is part that, um, this is where I think it gets real for us. Because, um, like me, uh, a lot of us have broken paths. And possibly... You're living in a broken present. You're in a relationship that's struggling, a relationship that may be painful. You're in situations that you go, I hear what you say, but I don't really, if you knew what I'm going through, you, you wouldn't understand that. And sometimes we're living in those kind of relationships or we're living in those kind of places in our life that we can't even understand the love of God like that. We, have made, we may have made all sorts of false agreements with ourselves that prevent us from living in the reality of the amazing love our Father has for us. So what's a false agreement? It's something that you believe to be true that isn't. And unfortunately, has the potential to cause all sorts of heartache in life. Let me give you an example, because for me, examples are always a lot better. Um, I have a friend who in fourth grade, um, and this, we're talking, how old are you when you're in fourth grade? About 11? Something like that, doesn't matter. The, the whole class, there's a smart person who was only nine in fourth grade, wow. No, just kidding. Uh, so they were asked to write, a, the class was asked to write an, an essay for the next day. And uh, the essay was, farmer has a wife and two kids, they have a pig and some chickens, and uh, it's a famine, and it's coming winter. What are they going to do? And uh, so he wrote it all down. And the next day, he gets uh, to class, and the teacher comes in, and she goes, I read one of the stupidest essays in my life. I can't even believe somebody would write something like this. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm going to read it to you. The guy actually thinks that you should actually butcher the pig and then take the eggs from the chicken, and that's how you get through winter. Is that stupid or not? And he said, it was his, by the way, he made an agreement that day out of shame. He would never let anybody 
read anything he wrote again. Do you see what agreement he made to himself? He agreed at that early stage that he would never be put to shame again. Therefore, he would never ever write again. That's a false agreement. So, fast forward 50 years. He has authored two books and is uh, translated in 13 languages because he recognized that he had made a false agreement back then and that God had to sh gently show him what that meant. But you see, it paralyzed him and it actually, he said, kept him from how God loved him. False agreements are a spiritual battle for our hearts and minds. You see, new creation, old thought processes, new creation, God loves you, pours himself into you. You still have, somebody said, uh, DOS wiring that needs to be brought up to, I'm biased, Apple, God needs to start to transform that. Let me share another one. By the way, um, they are, these false agreements are things that we believed which were deceptions meant to destroy our relationship with our Heavenly Father. They can be born out of shame like um, the story above, but they can be other painful experiences that affected our view of life like divorce, abuse, um, death of someone we love. They could be repetitive words of a parent or a teacher or a friend that tell us that we'll never succeed, we'll never be loved, especially by God. We're too fat, we're too dumb, we're not liked, who could ever like us? We can make some of our own agreements. I'll never be hurt like that again. I'll never be laughed at like that again. I will never forgive that person. Those are all false agreements that you make, that you store up. And what do they do? They, they separate us from God. There are uh, a lot of you that I know from a long time ago, so you'll have heard this story, and I'm using it just because I've got several false agreements over the years that I've had. The first one was, coming from a broken home, my mom was on her third husband by the time I got married. And I, I met Vivian when I was 16, by the way. Fell in love with her and thought, this is it. This is who I want to marry. When we got married, though, in my back of my mind, I always believed that if things didn't work out, I could always leave her. Is that weird? But that was the agreement that I'd made in my mind. Things didn't work out. I could always leave her. The amazing thing about God and His gentle kindness is that He brings those up to us. What I came to realize is that Satan wants believers to live as slaves, free, but not living like they're free. Um, a couple other ones. Uh, three or four years ago, there's a, there's a song that um, I love. By the way, I, I love our worship uh, people. I love the way in which they bring um, their hearts and souls to worship with us. And uh, I love that new song, Austin. That was amazing. Um, but he was singing a song, I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So I sing with my eyes closed and I'm singing, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And I, finally, I opened my eyes and looked up and, holy smokes, that's not the words. So I started singing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And God said, yes, you are. It was funny, I was uh, 
listening to a worship video this morning, and uh, it's amazing. It's uh, Brooke Ledgerwood, and she was singing, um, um, There's Power in the Name of Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sitting there listening to it, and uh, she, is, she starts off, um, it doesn't really matter what the song is, but she's on her knees just worshiping, and uh, she, uh, she just yells out, There is power! And I'm just start to ball. I mean, it's just so overwhelmingly powerful. And Vivian goes, well, I didn't like that part. <laughs> so she's sitting back someplace else. But it's, it's amazing at, um, the, how music just can um, just overwhelm you at times. Or for me, that's a way that just draws me to God. But he said, you fear what your children are going to, what's going to happen to your children. You fear what's going to happen as you get older. And I made um, agreements in my mind. That I could look after everything. That I was in control. I made agreements that I didn't really, I got to the place where I had everything that I needed and that's all I needed to do was keep that. And it's interesting how God does things like this if you allow him to point them out to you. But that day, I did the same thing as I'm doing now. recognizing that I'd made a false agreement and that was stopping me from being intimate with my Savior, allowing him to be my all in all, allowing him to be my peace, allowing him to be my provider, allowing him all the things that he should be in my life. And it just, it doesn't stop, by the way. You, you all, we, have, Vivian and I have gone through over the last uh, couple of years some significant health issues. And uh, I was telling the elders and uh, uh, people in our, in, our home, in our home group that I had realized that another false agreement that I had made, and it, I, I go, Lord, how many of these are there? For goodness sake, how many do I have in my head that I make? How much DOS is running up there? Um, that I had misplaced where my joy should be. I found all my joy in my wife. It's a cool thing, by the way, that part. That, that, that part's really cool. But it's not, because when my wife is struggling, when my wife is um, um, in pain, when she's debilitated, what happens to me then at that point? Right? I misplace my joy from the Lord to the joy of my wife, and when she is in pain and when she's suffering, I now don't do well, right? Because I've misplaced. I had this false agreement that, that she was the one that brought the joy to my life. She was the one that I needed to have in my life to be joyful. When in fact, my heavenly Father should be my joy, my salvation, my strength. And I should at those times bring that joy of the heavenly Father to my wife's knees, right? But I had made a false agreement and thank the Lord that he doesn't stop. The devil wants to separate us from the love of God. He wants to drive a wedge between us and God and influence our behavior. The devil's a liar, a devourer. He's constantly tempting, accusing, and deceiving the brethren. And you've got to realize that that's happening. He doesn't want you to have an intimate relationship with the Father, even though you are saved, positionally a son or a daughter of His, the devil wants to try and wedge that away. Our battle is not of this world. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. 
The interesting thing is sometimes our minds will not recognize the deep-seated agreements we have made and harbored unknowingly. So don't be afraid to ask the Lord to show you these false agreements if they're there. I'm betting. Uh, wrong, wrong place to say that, isn't it? I'm betting. <laughs> no money in my pockets. Um, that each one of you has spent a bit of time with the Lord. He's going to show you. And he's going to want you to actually look at that. And if you don't know if that's true, you just go to Psalm 139, verse 23, and it says, maybe, it's a promise. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Remember, untrue thoughts we accept to be true will become an agreement that, if left unchecked, eventually becomes a stronghold. And that stronghold, if left in our lives, will separate us from the one who loves us. Don't cover it up. Don't act like there's nothing wrong. What I loved about what has transpired in the last month in this, the, the transparency. I like being part of that. I want to be part of a church that doesn't say, hi, I'm fine. Hi, I'm fine. Are you fine? Yeah, I'm fine. I love my brother here sharing his heart last week or the week before. Don't cover it up. If you move it from darkness into light, the devil has no power over you. Take control of the thought before a stronghold needs to be demolished. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought to, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This Brooke Ledgerwood that I was telling you about with Hillsong, they wrote a song, I Am Who You Say I Am. How many of you were here Christmas Eve? Uh, that last song that we sang was from that same group. That It's just, they, 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 just like Austin was talking about wanting to be scriptural as he writes, that's what they do. But they wrote, uh, they did an interview. My daughter sent me the link to the interview, and I want to share it with you. Uh, this is Brooke uh, Ledgerwood talking. There are a lot of things and people in this life who try to tell you who you are. Your identity deserves better than that. What matters most is not what your past, your postal code, your gender, your racial or cultural background, or your marital or employment status says about who you are. What matters is who God says you are. You're loved. You're chosen. You're made in the image of God. God is for you and not against you. You're not longer a slave to sin. The power of sin was destroyed through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Amen? But you're a child of God, a son or a daughter. While a slave might have no permanent place in a family, a son or a daughter will belong forever. So a side note, I was talking to, um, I think, one of the elders if in those culture you adopted someone as a son or a daughter, you were not allowed to turn them away. They were yours forever. You could disown a son. You could not disown an adopted son or daughter. And what are we? Adopted sons and daughters if we've given our lives to Christ. I wrote this song with Reuben Morgan because I need this reminder probably too often. Competition for identity is insidious. So when you need a reminder of who God says you are, these scriptures are powerful. They'll show up behind me. You're chosen, called of God. You are being changed into his image. You're a new creation. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're forgiven of all your sins. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. You're blessed, victorious, set free, strong in the Lord, healed by his wounds. You're free from condemnation. You're reconciled to God, a joint heir with Christ. You are more than a conqueror. You're accepted, complete, dead to sin, alive in Christ. 
and the mind of Christ is in you. You can do all things in Christ. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You triumph in Christ. You're beloved of God. You're one with Christ, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? Amen. So in closing, in Romans 8, 31, 35, 37, 39, I'm just going to read them with you. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you've given your life to Christ, your position is secure. Your heart's been changed. If you've struggled like I have, God desires to start to transform this. Transform your memories, your thoughts, to come in line with who you really are. I would love that as you begin this new year, that you desire to say, God, show me. You love me, you care for me, show me. Is there anything that separates me from you? Don't believe the enemy that would tell you there is. God will gently bring things to mind. And when he brings them to mind, he doesn't just leave you there. He then walks you through repentance transformation will you stand with me we're going to pray Father thank you for these brothers and sisters here and Lord God only you know their hearts Holy Spirit, I pray for each one that has given their life to you that you would just fill them with a sense of your love for them, that you would fill them with your sense of, um, of purpose in them. And Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, show them areas that are preventing them, Lord God, from feeling how you feel about them. May this year be a year of amazing change as our transformation turns into sanctification that we may be made pure with you, Lord Jesus. Help us to be thankful in all trials and tribulations. So go with them, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for that. Amen.